Hey, what's up, nerds? Paul at Radio Free Hammer Hall. And today we are beginning our exploration of the new Caradron Overlords book. So, buckle up, guys. This is one hell of a ride. Now, this is actually going to be a multi-part series, and this is really just sort of the introduction and overview. So, um... A lot of this might be kind of information that people already know, but anyway, I just wanted to go over the basics before I started diving deeper and deeper into this book. So, what the heck is with Caradron Overlords anyway? Um, they are probably the heaviest shooting army in AOS. And what I mean by that is... Every one of their War Scrolls has a shooting attack. And most of them are pretty good. The army is really built around all of its stuff shoots. So, um, the shooting isn't necessarily the most powerful. It is uh, definitely a lot of longer range shooting. It's really a quantity over quality thing for most of them. A lot of the shots that you're going to be making are, you know, it, not overwhelming individually, but the fact that you can unload an ungodly amount of shots from every unit in your army, theoretically, is what really makes them powerful. They're also extremely high mobility, they have high movement on most of their units. Uh, their sky vessels can fly high, which is basically a teleport, and they can bring other uh, units along with them, as well as uh, units that are garrisoned inside them get to come along for the ride. And because of this, you can effectively make a list where your entire army can teleport every turn, which is just outrageous. And on top of that, if they choose to not do that, then they have a lot of 10, 12 inch movement that all flies to make up for that. It's generally a low model count army, and there are very, very few real melee options for you in the army. There are a couple of places where you can get some solid melee attacks, but it's not a significant component of your game plan. Really, this whole army revolves around the shooting phase. That is really the drumbeat of the whole army, is shooting, 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 shooting. That's what the army does. If you are not up for buckets of dice every shooting phase and getting your ass kicked in melee, uh, this is not going to be the army for you. So, some limitations of this army. I, I don't want to dwell too much on the limitations, but I did just want to kind of hit them off at the top. There's been a lot of people that are critical of this book, and I wanted to kind of address some of those things. But um, overall, I, I'm of the mind that we want to work with the book that we have, not the book that we wish we had. So there are pretty limited buffs available for your shooting. It's really a lot of fairly weak buffs, a lot of once per game stuff, or re-rolling ones to hit. It's not strong buffs to your shooting that you're getting out of this. Your battalions are generally kind of bad, but they are very frequently played just to reduce your drops and get an extra artifact and an extra engine work. You know, there's a lot of trade-offs in the army. Um, you know, for example, you might have weapons with better range but lower firepower. Um, you often kind of have to lose one thing to gain another. It 
it's just sort of, um, you can't have your cake and eat it too in this army. You really kind of have to go in a direction and stick with that. Um, there's really only one really strong melee unit in the army. There's a couple of decent melee heroes, but they are not, uh, one man armies. Um, and your one good melee unit, the uh, engine riggers that are all outfitted with saws. Um, first of all, it's not that exciting of a melee unit. And second of all, it's pretty fragile. At low model count for, and low wound count for a lot of points. So um, the melee build out of those is questionable. Anyway, I, I, I didn't want to dwell too much on the negative, so let's move on. So, beyond this book, um, we do have some other things uh, that we can use in the book. One of our Skyports, Brock Thring, allows you to use other Dwarden as one in four of your units. Uh, and then you, your allies list is basically all of the factions that include any Dwarden plus uh, Stormcast Eternals. And it's worth noting that Brock Thring and your allies stack. So you can end up with a list that is more than 50% non Caradron Overlords units by points anyway. Um, you can pick up some strong melee options out of Fire Slayers and Dispossessed. There's, again, that this is one of the places where you sort of start getting trade-offs. If you start adding strong melee blocks, then you're significantly depleting your uh, quantity of shooting. So we'll talk about that more later. Uh, Dispossessed and Iron Weld Arsenal also offer some interesting shooting options. Iron Drakes can be very strong, uh, and there is one particular combo that I do like with Iron Drakes to really potentially build an army around. Um, at the moment, I have not done the math on all of the Iron Weld Arsenal stuff yet. Um, my general feeling, though, is that it's fairly weak. By the time I actually get to the video where I do the math on that, I will have done the math on that. Uh, I've done a lot of the math already on this army. I just haven't done all of the um, extraneous things. Um, your allies, in general, don't really synergize with the Caradron Overlords, at least not in any sort of, like, this thing buffs all Dwarden kind of way um you know you can have synergies in terms of like things that work well together or complement each other but other than that like you're there's no keyword synergies shall we say an interesting note here um brock thring allows you to use all dwarden and there really is no restriction on what dwarden means so unless you are playing in a say a tournament environment where compendium war scrolls are not allowed you can dig into the compendium for all of the uh dwarden that are discontinued now uh that still have compendium points and war scrolls uh, and then the other really funny, interesting one is that uh, the Hell Cannon does have the Dwarden keyword. So, uh, theoretically, you can take Hell Cannons in this army. I'm not sure that you would, or you would have a Hell Cannon to throw in, or what. But it's just a funny thing to note that you can arguably do that. So, the math hammer on this, this is the meat of things that you guys were probably coming to this video for in general. I'm not really going to have any math in, 
this video, but I'm going to kind of go over uh, why we're math hammering this. Um, there's definitely units that fill similar roles or the same role within this army. So there's a lot of comparisons that we can make. And a lot of, well, I say a lot of, uh, basically all of the Karadran Overlords units have uh, different weapon options uh, where they can swap out standard weapons for special weapons um, or have different loadout options. So you're paying the same points for those and they're different options. So there is always the potential for one option to be more powerful than another. And that is why we're doing the math hammer here to find out what the more optimal choices really are. You know, in recent, uh, well, I would say in recent years, but really it's been, you know, the recent books that have come out really in like second edition, they're very balanced in terms of like an internal balance within the book. If you're comparing similar things, you know, something with similar firepower would have a similar number of points you know, you'd have a, a pretty spot on relationship between your damage output and the other characteristics of a unit and what the points are. Like they, they should all track together pretty well. Uh, this book in particular, because it has so many different loadout options for different units that are not the standard power level. Uh, it means that uh, Math Hammer is actually valuable for this particular book. And very importantly here is um, shooting is tricky, especially when you're doing a lot of it. So understanding the math before you start picking targets and splitting shots and all of that kind of thing um, knowing the math ahead of time really helps so that you don't have to sit at the table with a calculator in order to make a decision or, uh, you know, just make a half-assed decision. This can help you make uh, more informed decisions about how much damage a unit is actually going to do when it shoots at something. So kind of went down the rabbit hole with this and this is why this ended up becoming a series instead of like one one-off video or a couple of videos um a lot of this book has different buffs things that cross-reference each other between the allegiance abilities artifacts command traits etc and the war scrolls War Scrolls referencing between each other, um, you know, the different sky port abilities, all of these things, and the battalions, of course, that those all screw with the value of units in general. So it kind of makes me go, okay, really, I need to do a math hammer focused review of the whole book. And that's really going to be the best way to figure out the value of all of these things. And some of it's going to be relative to particular circumstances. So that itself kind of requires a deeper dive and a, a broader look at what this book has in it, because it's a lot. And a lot of it is not in the war scrolls. It's all of the other crap in the book that makes this complicated. And just to make it even more complicated, we have Brock Thring that lets you use all of the other Dwarden. We have allies. Um, and uh, we have the spell in a bottle, which uh, lets you take uh, an endless spell and cast it without rolling and it can't be unbound. So, you know, and that can be any 
endless spell in the game. So, um, it really means that I'm going to have to look outside of Caradron Overlords as well to look at some other options since they really are kind of sticking out like a sore thumb that there's things outside of this book that are relevant to it and maybe good additions. So, yeah, uh, we're going to go beyond just uh, Karadran Overlords with this series. We'll be taking a look at other things in relation to how they fit into this book. So, here is my approach to this. Basically, shooting is pretty much the only thing we care about in this army, because that's really the central focus. So, the majority of the math hammer that I'm doing on these things is just focused on shooting firepower and ranges and all of those kinds of things. Um, my general methodology for my calculations, um, I, I just basically model the average of, uh, you know, a unit's output and, you know, we can kind of tell from that what the, uh, spread of different outcomes can be, but in general, um, I'm really just kind of looking for the average, what law of large numbers is going to make us fall into. Um, and in order to account for rend, I used all of my calculations, assuming the enemy has a four up save, um, just to, you know, four up is a pretty common save and having, you know, a five up instead of a four up is not, uh, going to really make a big difference on the impact of one weapon versus another. It's just going to give us, um, you know, a baseline for accounting for rend in the calculation. Um, because we have all of these different weapons with different ranges and different outputs and different circumstances where things work differently, um, there's, you know, as I'm looking at it right now, three different calculations that I'm going to be doing for each unit. Um, the first would just be it's optimized maximum damage output. You know, whatever combination of weapons is going to just dump the most damage onto the opponent. The next one is the damage output for weapons that are greater than nine inches. Uh, so our fly high ability on our ships puts us outside of nine inches of enemy models. So we need to be able to shoot more than nine inches if we're going to use the fly high rule and then open fire. So that's why that particular one is in there. And then um, also calculating the maximum damage output for weapons that have greater than 12 inch range. Um, that's really looking at the weapons that are more flexible. You know, uh, just because something, you know, you can fly high and theoretically shoot at something doesn't mean your other guns aren't going to take that thing out first and now you aren't in range of any targets and you have, you know, a whole bucket of shots that can't have anything in range. So it's definitely important to look at longer range things and, you know, we'll be talking about, you know, the utility of making a longer range choice versus the shorter range, more powerful choices. Um, I'll also take a look at some of the melee stuff, um, particularly in uh, things that we can ally in. Um, the viability of that is still really not known. We don't have a lot of uh, tournament finishes with this army, period. Uh, and we don't really have too many tournament finishes at all. I don't think any that really were using Fire Slayers or Dispossessed or anything like that in the list to... Uh, make for something interesting. 
But I definitely do want to look at Melee and talk about that a bit. I, I, I am not sure of how viable it is, but I want to look at it at least. So, yeah, uh, this turned into a series instead of just one big video. Um, it, as I started doing the math, the variables just started growing very, very quickly. Um, and I wanted to be able to do in-depth analysis. And if I'm going to do in-depth analysis, it was going to turn into like a five-hour video or something absurd like that. Um, and people's attention spans are too short for that. And, you know, people don't always want to view all of the different things. They might be looking for one particular aspect of it. So then I would have to go through and timestamp everything so people can scroll through and find it. Um, and all of that's just a pain in the ass. So it's a lot easier, a lot better for everybody to just do a series of videos, and also that lets me uh, get more content out faster so you don't have to wait for one big video to come out after I've done a massive project. I can sort of do little projects at a time and get that out to you guys sort of piecemeal, and, you know, eventually I'll just have, like, a playlist or something like that where all of it's collected so basically, at, at the end of the day, what I'm going to be doing is an in-depth review of this book and its, uh, you know, ally components as well uh, through the lens of Math Hammer, uh, because all of this this army is very um, fertile ground for Math Hammering. You know, a lot of times you have armies where the math hammer is just theoretical stuff, but with shooting, it makes your math hammer a lot more reliable for what's actually going to happen on the battlefield. So that's, I think, why this is really important to do, and I think math hammering the hell out of this army is going to be one of the things that really helps people to unlock the juicy goodness in this army. Uh, because this army is not simple. This is not an entry-level, uh, newbie-friendly army. This is... I don't want to say it's a pro-zone only, but this is uh, not for people that want to just, you know push their models around and throw dice. Uh, this is an army you have to think a lot about starting right from the very basics of list building, let alone how it all plays out on the table, which is, uh, frankly, really weird compared to every other army in the game. Um, this is a very, very unique army, and so I'm really excited to pick it apart. So that is it for now, guys. Don't forget to like and subscribe, as always. And if you would care to, uh, you can support us on Patreon to help improve the channel. 100% uh, of our proceeds go back into the channel for making improvements, like equipment and software. So if you'd like to see better content, then absolutely uh, check out our Patreon. So with that, I am off, and I have uh, more videos to make for you guys, so stay tuned.